This chapter is great. We're seeing Bakugo and the rest of the team that's at the floating UA fortress right now, taking on Shigaraki slash all for one, who's like freaking out Tetsuo style. And Bakugo's getting like a power up in this chapter for sure, you know, through an arsenal upgrade. And it's pretty satisfying to see. I'm like a big fan of Bakugo. But unfortunately, we're like moving away from the all for one stuff that was being touched on the previous chapter, where he may or may not have been using a variant of Ares quirk that you Shiko possibly backward engineered from the quirk destroying bullets. But anyway, like I said, Shigaraki's body is like freaking out right now. As we saw before, he's become like a mass of fingers and hands and just flesh. So much so that they can't even pinpoint like his actual body. And Edshot winds up hitting him with a named move called the Shattering Paper Thread. And he says, how could this not be a quirk? You said this was just a natural growth, but that's impossible. So this is kind of like a rehash of what happened in chapter 347 the last time that we were like primarily focusing on this fight. And Shigaraki at that point said that, yeah, bro, it's not a quirk. My body has been altered to accommodate this power. And I guess it wasn't good enough for Edshot because he's getting re-educated here. But All For One is taking over Shigaraki's body this time and explaining it himself. And he says, believe it or not, that's how it is. As the All For One quirk settles in, various external factors and the swarm of quirks have combined molding this body into a suitable accommodation. So yeah, Yujiko realized that All For One was becoming too powerful and that his current body that he had wouldn't be able to contain the power that he was receiving. So they would have to develop a new vessel for him. And long story short, they eventually came up with this plan to make Shigaraki the new vessel and Yujiko wound up modifying his body so that he would be able to contain all of the theoretical power that All For One would eventually have. And that's what we get here. His body freaking out and becoming this big amorphous mess is kind of just a side effect of a vessel that is capable of containing all of this power. But going further, he says, with this body and its power, I shall create a new world. I'll become God and rule above everyone else. A world so divided that standards cease to exist for human bodies and abilities is doomed to collapse and disappear. Our confrontation is but a product of that world. At least under my control, everyone will be equal in oppression. Isn't that a step towards the peace you heroes want? Also guys, if you like my My Hero content, please subscribe if you haven't already. It's fine if you don't want to, but if you just needed a reminder, here you go. So a few things to break down here. Overall, what he's saying here is what his ultimate goal is, to become like this all-reliant global dictator, I guess. And that goes back to what Aoyama was telling Izuku at the beginning of this arc, where he wants everyone to like rely on his quirks and abilities for like their utilities and just the means of survival, essentially. But also the line about a world so divided that standards cease to exist for human bodies and abilities is doomed to collapse and disappear. I assume he's talking about the quirk singularity which essentially means that as time goes on and quirks become more powerful and mixed together through, you know, hereditary means and whatnot, humanity will like essentially self implode. Whether it takes like 100 years or 300 years or whatever, it's eventually going to happen. And also judging from the line where he says everyone will be equal in oppression, this could mean that he wants to monopolize quirks as well, meaning that like he uses his ability to take everyone's quirks. So he's the only human left with quirks. And that is a way to stop the quirk singularity. So all for one, while he is, you know, the typical take over the world villain here, there is a little bit of altruism sprinkled in there for sure. And I theorize that this is essentially how the this series kind of has to end one way or another. And I thought Izuku was eventually going to do this. I figured that, you know, it's possible that some way he's going to get the all for one quirk and then take all the quirks on earth or something like that. Because if he doesn't, or if someone doesn't, then the quirk singularity is kind of bound to happen. And also speaking of the quirk singularity, that's kind of what we're seeing in real time here with Shigaraki's big flesh amalgamation. In theory, everyone could wind up looking like this in time. And if it's not this that causes the end of humanity, just everyone all Tetsuoing out together, there could just be Ares being born, where their quirks are just not destroying their immediate vicinity, but they're destroying like five mile radiuses at a time or whatever. But anyway, Bakugo's had enough of this, and he's like, given how much I've been moving around, it must be charged up. With this item from the support course, I will clear a path. And then he says, area suppressing heavy armor activated, strafing panzer. And we see Bakugo's new support item. And this is amazing. And it's like multiple cannons mounted on his back 
back. And it looks like it activates with the same kind of suppression technology that Izuku's gauntlets have, which is uh, support tech from America. We're not gonna mention Melissa or David Shield for some reason, even though they're technically canon. But I'm assuming that these work the same way that his gauntlets do and probably have a similar level of power. And also him saying, giving how much I've been moving around, it must be charged up. Moving around, building up sweat, that's going to be the ammunition for these things because you know his sweat contains nitroglycerin, it's this quirk. And he says, we'll crush the main body together while he's like firing in 360, destroying as much of the flesh as he can. Mirko's like, he's finally learned the art of teamwork, huh? So simply just saying that, you know, we'll crush the main body together and doing what Bakugo normally does is him learning the art of teamwork. Then we see the other heroes who are working with them at this point, like Monoma and Aizawa shutting down all of Shigaraki's quirks so that he's only relying on the flesh mass. Kaminari and select other students are like using their electric quirks to power the UA fortress so that it can stay elevated. And Momo and Lunch Rush are working together to like produce pieces of like the platform and whatnot. And also I realized that Lunch Rush's quirk has never been revealed and we may never know what it is, unless it's revealed in like a data book that comes out after the series is over. I assume it has something to do with food production. But Bakugo is essentially coming full circle here because he's remembering when Izuku had initially saved him and his character arc is coming to light. And he says, misunderstandings in turn give rise to fear and rejection. You're gonna tell me about misunderstandings, fear and rejection? I accepted all that long ago, but I didn't just accept it. I'm way over it. I found people who are willing to put all that aside and move forward no matter what it may take. And then the chapter ends with him hitting Shigaraki slash all for one with his new ultimate attack maybe, which is called the Howitzer Impact Cluster Bomb. And this is just an upgrade to the Howitzer or impact, which is like, aside from the United States of Smash, my favorite move in the series. I love this so much. It not only looks great, but the application of it totally makes sense. And the overall result of it is just amazing. And it's, you know, Bakugo. We saw him use this in the sports festival against Shoto, but I don't think he's done it in like the manga slash anime's continuity after that. We've seen him do it in like two of the movies, but maybe that's why he did it because it's like way too powerful for him to use it outside of those continuities. But yeah, like I said, that's where the chapter ends and we don't get to see the full result of it yet But you know in the next chapter we will unless they cut back to the all for one stuff So coming off at the end of the previous chapter We saw Bakugo using his new ultimate move Which is the howitzer impact cluster, which is obviously an upgrade to his howitzer impact One of the coolest moves in the series and I wish he could have used this more He winds up hitting Shigaraki slash all for one with this move and it's pretty spectacular like the the resulting explosion from this is like the size of the UA floating fortress, which is freaking huge. This is like easy top 10 feats in the series for sure. And uh, Bakugo certainly deserves to have this moment, although it kind of falls flat because, you know, there's like a lot of variables going on here. And, uh, you know, Bakugo himself kind of needs to be protected in this sequence. And of course, along with Shigaraki slash all for one, and I'll go into that. But considering, you know, how massive this explosion was, it's uh, clearly going to be felt by everyone here. And we see the other heroes who are supporting everything reacting to it. And I think this is Power Loader saying like, please tell me he didn't destroy the power lines. Hey, also guys, if you like my My Hero content, please subscribe if you haven't already. It's fine if you don't want to, but if you just needed a reminder, here you go. And then we cut to the electric quirk students who are like powering the fortress at the moment. And Yuya is there from class 3A. She says, hey, what's wrong with that kid? Is he trying to blow up the whole stage or something? And Kaminari is like, ah, it'll be fine. Despite appearances, that guy's quite meticulous. I'm trying to say he's not the type of guy to disregard his surroundings in a fight. And all for one slash Shigaraki clarifies that by saying a highly condensed blast, maximizing the output while while avoiding any damage to the environment. So yeah, Bakugo has become a pretty accomplished Dragon Ball Z character at this point. You know how like their attacks can blow up galaxies or universes or whatever, and it only winds up making like a crater or something. And it's allegedly because of their key control. That's essentially what Bakugo is doing here. He uh, is using his key control because as we saw, the resulting explosion from the Howitzer Impact Cluster was like the size of the fortress itself, but it's somehow uh, avoided any damage to the environment. This is for multiple reasons, of course. First of all, 
if he blew up the freaking fortress, then that kind of defeats the purpose of everything that's been going on here. They kind of need that. It's integral to their plan in order to defeat all for one slash Shigaraki. But also this is a way, like I said, to protect Bakugo because we're gonna find out that this attack didn't really do much to all for one slash Shigaraki. I mean, it blew up some of his finger hand things going on here and it damaged a portion of the right side of his body. But outside of that, you know, it, the result of this was kind of anti climactic so it protects him by saying like hey maybe he could have did more and this definitely isn't the full extent of his power because he had to worry about the surrounding environment along with all of the other heroes here and like i also said it's protecting shigaraki slash hall for one as well because he can't you know wind up taking grievous wounds at this point because he still needs to be built up for his final battle with izuku or however it plays out which is obviously not right now but aside from that bakugo is taking maybe the worst damage he's ever taken in the series at this point i mean we saw him get stabbed through the admin back in the previous war and now while this isn't as severe or life-threatening as a wound as that was we see like the right side of his face is pretty badly damaged as well as like his right arm like his right arm is mangled i assume like beyond repair like in this one panel it looks like shigaraki slash off one is like wringing it out like a rag or something so i'm not saying that bakugo is done at this point because i don't know that in itself would be extremely anticlimactic if he just was benched for the rest of this arc considering that it's the last one and this is like you know the final battle so i'm assuming that he's still going to have you know some fight left in him i mean i've said this before and i'll say it again i really hope horikoshi just says you know screw it and then eri comes and does like a big i don't know emp or something and she just rewinds like all of the heroes at once back to like their 100 states then the offensive heroes there try to capitalize on the damage that bako has done to shigaraki sash off for one but he winds up just like smacking them away with like a shock wave similar to what all might used to do with his smashes and in fact shigaraki sash off for one says to be smashed by the power that rivals All Might. So still clearly only rivaling All Might, still not saying that it surpasses him. That could be there purposely, maybe for exposition to be put out there later on that Izuku has surpassed All Might. I'm assuming they're talking about Prime All Might at this point, which we still don't fully understand the crazy power that he held at one time. But this makes Bakugo realize that, you know, there's a huge gap between them still. Like the Howitzer Impact Cluster was Bakugo's absolute best move. Like, that's the peak of his power. And it didn't really do the amount of damage to Shigaraki slash All for One that he thought it would. Then Shigaraki slash All for One says, It's not your ideals or your dreams that interest me, Bakugo. The only thing that's ever piqued my interest in you is the fact that you're Midoriya's best friend. So that's pretty interesting. And I think that's going to play a part going forward here. He's, you know, likely to use Bakugo as some kind of pawn or something to get one for all from Izuku. Because that's like the big end game here for him hopefully that's not what bakugo is just reduced to but it's not looking good for him at this point because all for one slash shigaraki starts to walk him down and he's kind of by himself and aizawa's like you know mandalay what's with midoriya's status he's like even outside of the barrier the electromagnetic waves are messing with our transmissions all i'm getting is static right now so izuku is still mia because he was on his way to ua but we saw that he was encountered by something still don't know what that is yet and mandalay can't get into contact with him because the electromagnetic waves so that might have something to do with it possibly but aizawa was basically saying like man please someone save bakugo because he's about to die then we cut over to tamaki and nejiri who are i don't know going through the rubble or something talking about uh graduating after this uh hoping that nezu can uh, have one for them after this is over and then mirio shows up conveniently and He's like, I don't know, but at least we're gonna keep everyone safe until Midoriya gets here. The three of us together. And that's where the chapter ends. So where has Mirio been? I don't know. I don't know why he wasn't there initially. I mean, we could just assume that Horikoshi just wanted him to be away so that he would be able to have this moment, you know, at the end of this chapter. He didn't want to play all of his cards right off the bat, of course. But in story logic, I don't know. I mean, I don't know how much time has passed since the fight with Shigaraki at the floating UA Fortress has started. It probably hasn't been too long. So it's not like it's been like hours or something and then <laughs> Mirio just, you know, showed up at this point. But I'm sure we'll get 
get an explanation in the next chapter. I'm not saying it's guaranteed to make sense, but at least it's something. And now that Mirio is here, I mean, it's cool and all, glad that he's here, and I'm sure they'll be able to do something, especially all working together, which I don't think we've really seen yet. But, uh, you know, he's ultimately limited, because while his quirk is incredible, he still doesn't really have, like, superhuman strength or any kind of crazy abilities that would really be able to do anything against Shigaraki slash all for one at this point. Unless he shows, like, a new ability that he's adapted, or he has some kind of quirk evolution. I've always wanted to see Mirio, like, go inside of somebody's body and then, like, crush one of their internal organs or something. I mean, he's Mirio, so that's not his style, and he probably wouldn't ever do that. I mean, maybe to Shigaraki slash all for one, but, and it would be so cool if he just, like, went inside of his chest and then, like, crushed his heart, right? I mean, like I said, probably not gonna see that, but that would be pretty cool. So this chapter is a sad one, especially if you're a fan of Bakugo like I am, because at this point he's kind of been on like this downward spiral, which is hopefully culminating in this chapter and he doesn't go any further down than he already has, because not only has he been defeated physically, he's also been crushed mentally as well. Because in the previous chapter, we saw that he hit Shigaraki slash all for one point blank with like his ultimate attack in the howitzer impact cluster and while it looked super impressive like one of the best visible feats in the series it really didn't cause any kind of significant damage unfortunately and that was like the beginning of bakugo's spirit breaking essentially because you know that was his best after all and afterward shigaraki just messed up the right side of his face and completely mangled his right arm hey also guys if you like my my hero content please subscribe if you haven't already i'm super close to 200k so if you can help me with that that would be awesome thanks and we're seeing the follow-up to that at the beginning of the chapter here where shigaraki's like picking him up with his foot and instead of continuing the physical damage here he just piles on the mental anguish instead because he's like having my quirk erased right now is a blessing in disguise because your corpse will be left intact so his quirk is being erased because monoma is still currently siphoning aizawa's quirk because if he wasn't then shigaraki would just activate decay and everything would just be over instantly at that point but the whole corpse left intact line here means that he wants to use Bakugo as a device to basically have Izuku like rage out of control and to come to his emotions when he gets there because he also says remember his sheer fury when I poked you full of holes last time in reference to you know the previous war and yeah Izuku was pretty filled with fury at that point he wound up looking like a symbiote or something and then Shigaraki ultimately winds up saying like it's time for a reality check Bakugo no matter the heights you reach you'll never be more than Izuku Zuku Midori's hanger on a minnow in one for all's wake. So that doesn't seem too harsh to us, the readers, because, you know, the reality we live in is way more cynical than the My Hero reality. But to Bakugo, this is like worse than any physical damage he could take. Because like I said, his spirit was already breaking after he realized that he couldn't really do anything to Shigaraki. But now he's telling him something that maybe even he himself was thinking in the back of his mind, possibly. And not so much that he like Izuku's hanger on, but more so that like he'll never really be able to surpass Izuku. And aside from just, you know, becoming the number one hero, which is Bakugo's ultimate goal, his other big purpose and goal is to surpass Izuku, because realistically he would have to anyway to become the number one hero eventually. But now Izuku has become so unbelievably powerful that Bakugo has realized that like, yeah, it's probably not going to be able to happen at this point. And while he's not said it out loud, he's definitely probably been thinking about it, especially because of the reaction that we see Bakugo give to Shigaraki saying that. So yeah, Bakugo is pretty much completely broken at this point, or at least almost. But hopefully Bakugo gets some kind of redemption here or a second wind or something, because if he doesn't, then he's essentially been regulated to Vegeta status at this point. Also, the fact that everybody's kind of waiting on Izuku to show up and save the day more so makes it feel like that more than ever because 
you know, that's like Goku's thing. Not to mention, you know, Goku surpassing everyone else in the series and just leaving them so far behind on the power scale already. But Nedri comes in and tries to help Bakugo here, but, but Shigaraki just winds up using Bakugo as a shield and this thwarts her plan, of course. And then we see Tamaki come in and he injects Shigaraki with scorpion venom. And also Tamaki's line here saying, eating bugs is all the rage these days. It's kind of like letting the reader know that like, I can use this because I ate a scorpion. But this too was all for naught because a mouth opens on Shigaraki's shoulder and it just spits the poison out. And he says, my body continues to adapt. So this is in reference, of course, to the quirk singularity that he's currently speed running. So as we know at this point, Yuji Ko modified Shigaraki's body so that he would be able to use the full power of the all for one quirk. And doing so, his body is now, like I said, speed running the quirk singularity in order to compensate for this insane amount of power. And it winds up just causing this mutation phenomenon that is similar to what we see of Tetsuo at the end of the Akira movie. This is something that would normally take like hundreds or thousands of years in the My Hero world, but we're seeing it happen real time because of the specific circumstances that he's under. But then Mirio comes in trying to help the party out here, and we saw him show up at the end of the previous chapter. But Mirio even showing up here, uh, he's very limited in what he could do. I mean, like what we just talked about earlier, Bakugo's howitzer impact cluster only really did superficial damage to Shigaraki. So while Mirio's quirk is pretty great, even Mirio himself is like, until Midoriya shows up, I'll keep Shigaraki on the ropes. Going back to the whole, you know, everybody's stalling for Goku to show up thing. But Mirio asks Shigaraki slash all for one, he's like, why do you destroy? And Shigaraki's like, because the current framework has failed. Basically, you know, like we live in a society. And Mirio's like, oh, I get it. You've never had any friends. And this seems to get a reaction out of Shigaraki. Not all for one, of course, because he's like a full-blown psychopath. And this could be showing us what the future of this arc or just the future of Shigaraki's character arc is possibly. Because we did see before that there's some kind of like latent Tenko personality still inside of Shigaraki's mind. And it seems to revere Izuku. And we definitely saw that for a reason. I think it's going to be unlocked one way or another. And that's going to be how Shigaraki comes to his senses possibly. And I've said this many times, but I wouldn't be surprised if like by the end of the series, somehow, some way, Izuku gets Eri's quirk or Eri's quirk is just used on Shigaraki and he gets rewound back to Tenko, you know, before all the trauma happened. Because, because when you boil it down, Shigaraki slash Tenko is inherently innocent. It was all for one that crafted and caused everything, which uh, actually still hasn't been fully revealed yet. But then we come to the end of the chapter with Best Genus tending to Bakugo, who, you know, we just went over, had his spirit and will totally crushed here. And he's like, this foe is beyond any of us. He surpassed all expectations. We're well past the point of exploiting your previous encounters with Shigaraki. That was a stellar showing. You've done enough. And just when we think all is lost with Bakugo, we see him still observing Shigaraki fighting the big three. He's like right side, finger, faint. And Best Genus is like, even now, this boy, despite everything, he's still. And then that's where the chapter ends. And we can just assume he's saying he's still got fight left in him. He's still analyzing the battle. He still wants more. Despite, you know, getting destroyed physically and mentally here and being shown that there's pretty much nothing he can do. So hopefully this leads to, like I said, a redemption for Bakugo here. And he does do something substantial. It would be nice if Bakugo gets one last big win here, considering that this is the final arc. But he He's going against like the god villain. So it's just unlikely unless he gets one for all again or something like he did in the two heroes movie. And that would be incredible. But considering that it did happen in the movie, it's just unlikely that it's going to happen here. I mean, I hope it does. And I think Horikoshi did say that that was his original ending that he had in mind, but he just decided to use it for the movie instead. So coming off of the previous chapter, we basically saw like the downfall of Bakugo, I guess. And hopefully it was just short lived, but that essentially left them with the big three taking on Shigaraki slash all for one. And while that was happening, Mirio kind of called out Shigaraki and he said, you know, so why do you destroy? 
and Shigaraki slash all for one said, because the current framework has failed. And then Mirio said, oh, I get it. You've never had any friends. Otherwise, you'd realize there's plenty worth keeping around. And that statement there seemed to like strike a nerve in Shigaraki because we see in the beginning of this chapter that there's like this locked away personality fragment, I guess you could say, of Henko. Henko, of course, is the original version of Shigaraki, the grandson of Nana. And we first found out that this was even a thing back in, I think, chapter 334. It was at the very end of the Star and Strife fight as she was dying. She gave like a speech to Shigaraki slash all for one where she said, as long as people stand up to save each other, someone will inherit that will of heroism. And make no mistake, they will strike you down. And then we like go deep inside of Shigaraki's consciousness since there where we saw this Tenko personality fragment that was like being locked away by hands. And he said, someone, some hero. Midoriya. So I think that was kind of setting up that there's like this back door to Shigaraki. Hey also guys, if you like my My Hero content, please subscribe if you haven't already. It's fine if you don't want to, but if you just needed a reminder, here you go. Thanks. And that there still is a possibility of him being saved here. And I guess it's being represented as Tanko Shimura's personality. So how did this happen in the first place? Well, I assume that when all of the childhood trauma happened to Tenko, I guess Tenko split into what would become known as Shigaraki. The inherent innocent Tenko that was a part of him is just dormant within his mind. But this fragment of Tenko Shimura is so strong that it's still able to live throughout all of everything that Shigaraki's been through. You know, the body modification and all for one, like possessing him and taking over his personality entirely. So right now we have like this three-way struggle for the consciousness of Shigaraki's vessel, I guess you could say. It's like all for one's vestige consciousness, whatever you want to call it. He's like doing this Wi-Fi thing right now, hopping between his original body and Shigaraki's body. Then we have Shigaraki's personality, of course, which sometimes comes out, sometimes it doesn't. Now we have, you know, dormant Tenko going on at the same time. They're also all kind of melding together at the same time because during the Star and Stripe fight we saw that Star and Stripe couldn't really utilize her quirk fully on Shigaraki because one of the requirements for her quirk was knowing someone's name and the fact that Shigaraki and All for One had kind of melded their consciousnesses and personalities together they became like this new entity which apparently didn't have a name or at least a name that Star and Stripe wasn't aware of. So there's like a lot going on with Shigaraki at the moment, but I think that us seeing Tenko here is showing us what the ultimate end game for his character is, I suppose. And it's that this Tenko is going to break through eventually. And I'm pretty sure it's going to be through something that Izuku does because we saw that little Tenko mentioned, you know, Midoriya when we first saw him. So he reveres Izuku and that's for sure going to be the catalyst here. But anyway, we see like the Tenko personality like freak out inside of Shigaraki and he's like, Mikun and Tomo-chan say I'm a really good boy and Mon-chan is always looking forward to going out with me. Of course I have real friends. And Mirio is like, uh, this is awkward. Uh, I'm sorry. Maybe I shouldn't have said that. And then we see all for one slash Shigaraki acknowledging this and he's like, my mind feels as if it's splitting. This body is now complete, even though I should have fully assimilated Shigaraki. I can still sense an anomalous element lingering, something that hasn't been fully dissolved yet. It's not Tomura, nor all for one. And he says, Shimura, you know, uh, Tenko Shimura. And he says, I can't allow this to drag on anymore. So yeah, even he's fully aware now that the anomalous element of the Tenko personality fragment is possibly going to be a serious foil to everything that he's trying to accomplish right now. So he decides to basically abandon fighting Mirio here because he realizes that without his quirks, it's like a stalemate because Mirio is just going to keep permeating and he'll never truly take damage from whatever all for one can do with his big uh, amorphous limit. And then, you know, continuing to fight him is just a waste of time at this point, especially because of the lingering Tenko person. So he decides to go after Bakugo again because in the previous chapter he said that he basically wanted to kill Bakugo so he could present his corpse to Izuku. Therefore, Izuku would become, you know, berserk in rage and not be able to control himself. And that would obviously play to the strength of All for One. But Nedri and Best Genus continue to try to defend Bakugo here. And at the end of the chapter, we find out that not only have they 
they just been buying time in general for Izuku to show up and Goku style save the day, but they've also been building up time for Tamaki to use his, you know, ostensibly ultimate attack here. Because it says cornucopia combinations, true potential. Unleashing it takes a considerable amount of time. Then we cut to what Tamaki's been doing and he sprouted this massive grotesque, like, cannon out of his arm. And the wave that Nejiri was shooting at Shigaraki slash all for one is now actually going around him and going into the cannon because it says Nejiri's energy. So this thing is pretty incredible. It's like everything that Tamaki had eaten all combined into this one, like I said, grotesque looking cannon thing here. It's actually similar to what Shigaraki slash all for one has been doing with like his limbs and whatnot. And this is, you know, kind of similar to us getting a glimpse of what the full blown quirks singularity is because in theory this is what Tamaki's quirk could look like in a hundred years just inherently like essentially him or his descendants wouldn't have to push so hard to make this it would just automatically become like this because it would just have become so powerful you know being passed on and whatnot through the lineage and you know mixing with other quirks and whatnot as the quirk singularity states but then we see Nejiri and Mirio saying the more you eat the more powerful your quirk becomes there's no real upper limit to how much you can manifest with your quirk if there's someone capable of dealing some meaningful damage to Shigaraki, that's you. So I'm assuming that, you know, he's going to fire off this cannon at like the core of Shigaraki because it's like the base of him that's like the super tough part. And obviously they need to crack that if they're going to defeat him in the first place. And considering how crazy this thing looks, I'm guessing it's got to do some serious damage here. I mean, we saw Bakugo hit Shigaraki with his Howitzer Impact Cluster, which was insane, but it was only really able to do superficial damage for the most part. So it's possible this might do more than that. I mean, granted, it is, you know, Tamaki and Nejiri's combination attack here. And also one more thing, at the very end of the chapter, the narration says Tamaki's quirk awakens. Now, it could possibly say that, but Rukasu, the person who provides us with the spoiler summaries, said that I think it's important to clarify that at the end text for this week's chapter does not mention a quirk awakening of any sort. It simply says, let it all out. So I'm not saying that one transaction translator is better than the other or one is right and one is wrong i'm just saying that you know we should definitely look at both options here and i guess just use that to make up your mind on what's ultimately happening here which means that this may or may not officially be tamaki's quirk awakening but if we just look at it for what it is it pretty much is even if it's never outright said that this is like a quirk awakening or a quirk evolution i mean it, it basically fits the prerequisite for what that is anyway right so let's just call it like it is bakugo straight up dies in this chapter i mean like he's dead and i really don't know what to make of it because the circumstances around it are so odd and i'm not really sure what's going to come of this other than you know obvious outcomes but i mean more so narratively wise but let me explain what happened and what may come of it. So at the beginning of the chapter here, we see Tamaki hitting Shigaraki slash all for one with his cornucopia combination plasma cannon. This is like his ultimate ability essentially. And with the assistance of Nedri's waves, he fires off this crazy Dragon Ball Z-esque attack on him. But as we see, unfortunately, it does nothing to him. Like even less than what Bakugo's howitzer impact cluster was able to do. Also after surviving this, Shigaraki slash all for one claims that he's as strong as Prime All Might, which he's been alluding to throughout this arc, but I guess he is. Hey, also, guys, if you like my My Hero content, please subscribe if you haven't already. It's fine if you don't want to, but if you just need a reminder, here you go. Thanks. So after surviving this, Bakugo gets up and starts walking towards him. Bakugo was kind of benched for a chapter after getting initially defeated by Shigaraki slash all for one, but now he's back in the game and he says to Best Genus, take good care of everyone. And then he says to himself, we still have a battle to win. Isn't that right, Izuku? So this is already big right there because he's referring to Izuku as Izuku. Know that Bakugo is famous for calling him Deku, a demeaning manner, of course, but he's just straight up being as real as he could be 
right now. So that right there is already the beginning of us starting to worry about Bakugo here. Then he straight up hits Shigaraki Smash Ball for one with like the Goku Ultra Instinct attack. Yeah, this is like the second Dragon Ball moment of the chapter. And then he dodges Shigaraki Smash Ball for one's counter back fist here, which is incredible. So then we get an explanation as to what's going on with Bakugo here and why he suddenly becomes so ultra powerful and fast. So it gives us a reminder of what his quirk is, which is explosion, and he can detonate the nitroglycerin like sweat that comes out of his palms. We knew this, of course, coming in, but going further, it says Cluster Bomb, the move he devised, had a side effect that even he failed to notice. Concentrating his sweat into tightly packed spheres, this technique places a tremendous burden on the sweat glands in his palms. But since he kept pushing so hard against Shigaraki Sash All for one year, he kept accumulating the sweat spheres inside of his glands, which caused the spheres to disperse throughout his body in search of an outlet. The detonations going off inside of his body bring about increased speed. So essentially what Bakugo is doing here is like his own version of full cowling. Like instead of just it coming out of his hands like it traditionally does, I guess it's coming out of like most of the pores in his body essentially. So he has all of these explosions coming out of his body and like propulsing him. So he's able to kind of replicate how Izuku would be in full cowling or just using one for all. But as this is happening, Shigaraki says, why am I so angry? Why am I losing my cool against some run of the mill heroes who doesn't even possess one for all? And then suddenly he sees the second user of one for all. So the second second user is important, at least in relation to Bakugo, because of like one of the big theories in the community that's been around for like over four years at this point. And long story short, the theory says that the second user is Bakugo. And this is able to happen through some kind of time travel or time paradox thing. Now, since Shigaraki Sash All for One is remembering the second user here in relation to Bakugo, does this confirm that the second user is Bakugo? Well, of course, no. But it is odd that of all of the people he's remembering here, it's the second user. I mean, if he just wanted to remember somebody fighting fiercely against him without fearing him and having like such incredibly strong resolve, then he could have just remembered all of the one for all users in this instance, but no, it was just specifically the second one. So either the second user is somehow Bakugo or he's related to him in some way, or what Bakugo is doing right now with his quirk possibly reminds Shigaraki Sash All for One of the second user's quirk. Something that we still don't know yet. I mean, another similarity that the second user and Bongo have is that they both wear gauntlets. So, you know, maybe maybe not. It's just really ambiguous right now. But I can promise you one thing, that once this is all fully revealed, you're going to see tons of people saying, well, pfft, it was obvious. I knew the whole time. But the ambiguity doesn't end there because right after this, we see Bakugo go to like this white space and he sees the vestige of All Might. This is like the way that All Might is represented when Izuku goes to the One For All vestige world. We know that like a piece of the person that had used One For All is like stored within its quirk factor. And the resulting phenomenon produces like this force ghost that Izuku is able to interact with like a normal person once he goes inside of the vestige world. But more recently, he could just see them real time, just like, you know, like a Star Wars Force ghost, and they're able to communicate with him and whatnot. But since All Might is still alive, there's only like a piece of him that is represented as like this flame energy ghost thing. So why would Bakugo be seeing this? Well, like I said, it's ambiguous and there could be many reasons. So the first one is maybe because Bakugo has such a strong tie to All Might and he has such strong feelings for him that he's just able to see it because that's just how this scene is being represented as he is on death's door. And another reason is because Bakugo did actually have one for all, for a moment at least, at the end of the second movie. And that could mean that that movie's continuity is just becoming full-blown canon to the manga here. And I'm not saying it never was. I mean, just like the canon of battle manga movies with a battle manga series is always kind of iffy anyway. It never always like one for one ties into the main series. You know what I mean? Regardless of what the creators say in interviews or whatever. But in this one specific instance, this could be tying back to that moment. And since Bakugo did have one for all for the little bit of time that he did, then I guess a part of him was also stored within it. And of course, at the end of the movie, due to plot convenience, one for all wound up leaving Bakugo and going back to Izuku. So that could explain as to what's going on with Bakugo here. He's just interacting with like the one for all quirk Wi-Fi. But anyway, if Bakugo is tied to one for all, this is how he could technically live on for the rest of the series 
series as to where he just appears as a vestige ghost with the Zuku. And then he kind of just, I don't know, coaches him or helps him out. And maybe he gets his quirk too or something. But then he pulls out his All Might card and he says, I've always wanted to ask you to sign this for me. This is, of course, the card that we saw him and Izuku get out of like that bag of chips and the flashback when they were fighting against each other in season three. This card was super important to Bakugo, so much in fact that he even currently has it on him and he just never had the chance to fully ask All Might to sign it for him, unfortunately. So I'm not really sure what's going on with Bakugo in this sequence. Horikoshi is purposely doing this, of course, but there's just so many options here. But anyway, we're coming to the end of the chapter here and suddenly Bakugo's heart like either explodes or is getting pierced because in the follow-up panel to it, we see Shigaraki Sash all for one, like stabbing him in the chest with his arm. And then we get a report that clouds have appeared in the skies and that they were clear until moments ago. The cause of this phenomenon appears to be a sharp rise in temperature. So this could mean a lot of things too. It's possible that because of the cannon that Tamaki just fired off that it's caused it to rain here and this could just be symbolic for Bakugo's death you know it's starting to rain as he dies and it also goes back to the title of the chapter which is light fades to rain you know light Bakugo and also in this moment we see his mom saying that boy hates rain now it could be that or it could be because of something else that's going on currently in the war maybe something with izuku maybe whatever's going on with dobby and shoto <laughs> but that just brings us to the end of the chapter here in the final panel we see bak go on the ground lifeless eyes blood out of his mouth a gaping hole in his chest and it says the end of dreams so like i said in the beginning bakugo is dead here and i don't really know how i feel about this because if this is truly how bakugo dies then it kind of seems unceremonious i would have expected him to have a grander exit than this i'm not necessarily mad at it I'm just a little underwhelmed but maybe that's what horikoshi wanted and if he did then that's fine but for some reason i just feel like this isn't the end for him because you know in battle manga characters don't usually always die especially ones that are this important you know i mean it's not unheard of but you know there's a chance that eri could rewind him back to life and i do think that she's probably capable of that i mean that would kind of be a cop out of course just having her come and solve everyone's problems i personally wouldn't be mad about it because you know it brings more fun to the story but then again it's like does horikoshi lose credibility if he goes back on this moment and bakugo doesn't die and also we saw a glimpse of the future Future a couple chapters back, at least through Endeavor's mind, and Bakugo was there. And that doesn't literally mean that, that he saw the future for sure, but the future that he saw was so specific, you know what I mean? Like, it seemed more so like we were actually seeing a glimpse of the future rather than just what Endeavor pictured the future could be, if that makes sense. So, I don't really know. I mean, I just want to reserve my full judgment here because we are going on break next week and I don't want to be like, oh, well, you know, I feel completely this way and then it just gets swerved and then, oh, Bach goes back. I don't know, just a lot to think about right now. And uh, if Bongo truly is dead, then yeah, I'm saddened by it, of course. He's pretty much my favorite character, aside from All Might when he was capable of fighting. So it sucks to see him go, for sure. I mean, we are at the end of the series, after all, and there needs to be something like this that happens. But man, I'm just uh, conflicted right now, as I'm sure many of you are. So this chapter opens up with us seeing what happened to Bakugo. At the end of the previous chapter, he was seemingly killed by Shigaraki slash All for One, and it turns out that that's that's pretty much the case because best genus is checking on him here and he says there's no pulse his heart is ripped to shreds and yeah I guess that confirms that he's straight up dead but it still feels like there's a chance that he could come back mainly because of the whole pulse thing here now the heart ripped to shreds that's definitely not good but you know we are in battle manga after all and there are some things that can happen but whenever you hear like pulse or there's no pulse in like a show or something like that usually you know it means that like it could bring the pulse back maybe but also after best genius says this shigaraki is like boasting big time he's like this time he's gone for good putting so much responsibility on the shoulders of a kid you did this to him how very disappointing eraser who's next who wants to be turned into another welcome present 
for Izuku Midoriya. So that's like super harsh, especially like given the context of everything. It just doesn't seem like Horikoshi would necessarily just let that fly without any recoil or justification. Hey, also guys, if you like my My Hero content, please subscribe if you haven't already. It's fine if you don't want to, but if you just needed a reminder, here you go. Thanks. But however, at the bottom of this panel, we see Best Genus doing something. He's doing something to Bakugo, right? Because he's standing over Bakugo. He was the one who confirmed that he had no pulse and his sleeves are like coming apart here, which denotes that he's activating his quirk. And it looks like his arms and hands are on Bakugo. So he's definitely doing something here. And we speculated about this for like the last two weeks, but considering that Best Genus is Fiber Master and he can control any fiber, it's possible that he can control like the muscle fibers in the heart or the collagen fibers. And I know that sounds like so crazy, especially because it's already ripped up, but it's like, guys, again, it's battle manga. But with this, maybe he's not necessarily controlling like the actual fibers of the heart, but he's going to like repair his heart with like denim or something. Again, battle manga. But just this has really given me hope more than anything that I'm thinking Bakugo is coming back at this point. And it might not necessarily be Best Genius by himself that is fully able to do this, maybe with the assistance of another hero's quirk. He's able to bring Bakugo back here. But we're cutting away from that and we're surprisingly coming back to Shoto and Dobby. We haven't seen them since like 353, I think. And we're finding out like what was going on with Dobby because when we last left off with him, we saw like that light coming from his chest and that you know led to tons of speculation. Is it like a quirk awake? Is he gonna blow up the way that like Lady Nagant did, meaning that like all for one secretly put a bomb in him? But no, it's uh, neither actually. It turns out that Dobby was just able to copy Shoto's flash fire fist because he says, I knew it, it's so much better in person. It's like I got a feel for it somehow. Just before you buried me in ice, I copied your move as a last ditch effort. So yeah, that's it. And I'm not mad at this at all. I'm glad that it's not some kind of like quirk awakening and he's getting like ice or something. But I also wouldn't have minded if he blew up too but now he's in his own little proprietary flash fire fist mode similar to what we saw shoto use in their fight and he's like melting onima i don't know if onima is gonna die but he might but yeah it looks like this fight is going to continue and that's fine it felt a little too rushed in the beginning so it's fine if it's going to continue but i just hope it's more interesting than it was originally but Dobby screams to Skeptic, who apparently has been listening through this device on one of the Nomus nearby, and Skeptic figures that Dobby is looking for Endeavor, and he gives him an update saying that like Endeavor still facing off against All for One at Gunga Mountain. And I kind of just want to skip right to what's going on with All for One and Endeavor, because when we come to the end of the chapter, we're like fully seeing what's going on here, because we haven't really seen what was going on with them since chapter 357. At the end, we saw that All for One was like activating either Aries quirk or like variant of it or something because he like started to grow back his eye and ear suddenly after he said he was going to use like his last ditch effort or whatever which was implied to be experimental and it may or may not work and we saw like this image of Ari with the quirk destroying bullet and now that we're coming back to him it turns out that that's pretty much what's going on here because it looks like Ari's rewind magic stuff is like coming over his body and I guess for the first time we're seeing the most of all for one's face well most Mostly. There is still some rewind stuff on the left part of his face, but this is more than what we typically got because when we did see what All for One's face looked like before, you know, All Might Potato Fight it, it was, you know, obstructed by shadows around the eye. And there's no, like, huge reveal here because originally there wasn't really much left up to the imagination at that point. But considering that this is, like, the end of the chapter and nothing is really said about what's going on here, it's kind of just All for One doing a standard thing where he just, you know, talks crap to the heroes we don't really know what's going on so like i said he's using either like full-blown rewind or it's just some like variant or version of it or a derivative of it that yujiko was able to synthesize or something from the quirk destroying bullets meaning that like i don't know if he's 
fully rewinding himself here or he just was able to isolate the aspect of the quirk that can like heal you or something but if he is like fully rewinding himself here it's like how far did he go back because if he is rewinding himself you know however many years it's possible that he may rewind himself back to a point of where he had like different quirks maybe and that brings a whole other slew of issues and questions with it because like if he is rewinding himself back to a previous point in time and i guess the all for one quirk factor would as well then does it come with the quirks that he had originally because throughout time he's had different quirks whether he takes them at a specific time or he just gives them away at another time and if that is the case then he might be way more powerful now than what he originally was i mean aside from just having a, a complete body and whatever kind of power up comes with that you know quirks aside and i really wouldn't be surprised if he does get new quirks here because because it goes back to what we talked about last week with that jump promotional art that Horikoshi released a couple weeks ago where we saw like all for one pretty much in this form facing off against Izuku and that led us to think like oh that's like a spoiler because the last thing we saw was like his face regenerating and in that picture we saw you know him without the potato face taking on Izuku and also in chapter 357 it ended with us seeing Izuku being encountered by something in the distance and it was Yoichi of all people who was worried about it Yoichi the brother of all for one so it's possible that like he's using one of his new quirks that just lets him fly or something I mean we know that he had air walk but it also looked like there was like multiple things in the distance so I don't know maybe he's get some nomus with him and they all bring him there or something but that also implies that I, I guess he's just gonna straight up either defeat or just kill endeavor hawks and everyone else here which is understandable because they're you know really spent and he's just getting his second wind here but aside from that let's go into is he izuku's father and still don't know this doesn't really prove anything now that we're kind of fully seeing his face because he still like i said looks like how all for one looked and it never really implied that he looked like Izuku or anything so the verdict is still out and like I've been saying I'm not married to the whole thing about him being Izuku's father I just think it would make the story more interesting if anything but if it just turns out he's not and Hisashi Midori is just some random dude that maybe we see in the final chapter for like two panels then it's whatever but let me know what you think about this chapter in the comments what do you think's going on with all for one do you think he has been fully rewound so this chapter leads to an extreme turn of events that ultimately leads to Bakugo coming back to life or at least it appears that way. Obviously, this is something that I myself and many others wanted, but considering the circumstances around how it's happening here, it seems to have split the community, or for the most part, I don't know if it literally has. I mean, there's obviously a lot of outrage on social media, but you know, when isn't there? And sometimes like a vocal minority can seem a lot louder than they actually are. So I'm not really sure how split people are on this, but I could totally see why a lot of people have major issues with what's going on here so let me explain what happened and then uh, we'll talk about it so just to catch you up to speed when Bakugo was fighting against Shigaraki slash all for one it eventually got to the point of where his heart like got pierced and this like straight up killed him because afterwards best genus is standing over him and he's like this can't be no pulse his heart is ravaged and even Shigaraki slash all for one is like this time he's truly dead so yeah Bakugo died and he's been dead for like two chapters at least up until this one but also in the previous chapter we see best genus like standing over him and activating his quirk by you know manipulating the denim that he's wearing and coming into this chapter we see that he's doing something <laughs> Like, I kind of joked in my previous review that he was going to, like, repair Bago's heart with, like, denim or something. But it's like, is he actually trying to do that here? Like, what are you doing, best genus? Get that stuff out of his heart. It's dirty. Hey, also, guys, if you like my My Hero content, please subscribe if you haven't already. It's fine if you don't want to, but if you just need a reminder, here you go. But that also went into another speculation that we had about how Bakugo could potentially be saved here, just more so by Best Genus, because Best Genus is the Fiber Master, and he 
can manipulate any fiber, which means in theory he could manipulate like the muscle fibers or the collagen fibers in Bakugo's heart and save him that way. And I know that's problematic, but it is battle manga after all. But little did I know, I was severely underestimating Horikoshi and how far he was going to push the it's just battle manga here. Because Edshot starts walking up to Bakugo and Pest Genus, and he says, that's right, I'm a ninja hero that could sneak into anywhere. I've crept into so many bodies that I'm familiar with it all. And that's very much true. If we go all the way back to chapter 88, you know, at the Kamino raid, when they were initially trying to save Bakugo, coincidentally, Ed shot like disabled Kurogiri immediately. And Magni was like, I couldn't see whatever that was. Is he dead? And Ed shot coming out of Kurogiri was like, nope, just unconscious. I fiddled around with his insides. So yeah, I guess this means that Ed shot is like a, a master surgeon at this point. Just from years of experience being a hero and using his uh, quirk to go in people and fiddle around and stuff. Going further, he's like, I, Edshot, shall not accept this. That stopped heart is a life we cannot afford to lose. We could still make it. I'll fill in for whatever he's lacking and move for him. Then Best Genus is like, Kamihara, you can't come back from this. And then Edshot says, so then I'll leave the rest to you, President Hakamata. And then in the final panel, we see him start to like spaghettify himself where he's using maybe his ultimate ability, which is called Ninpo Thousand Sheet Pierce Extreme. And he says, I'll become his heart. So yeah, that's how Bakugo is coming back to life here. Edshot is literally going to become his heart. And it's like, okay, didn't see this coming. And considering that like, I'm such a big fan of Bakugo, this doesn't really bother me that much simply because I just want him to come back to life pretty much at any cost, even at the cost of the story necessarily making sense and even losing a character as a result. So like, I'll kind of just let it slide at this point, but I will acknowledge that this is like really out there and uh, probably unnecessary, right? Now, I don't necessarily think it's too far fetched to think that Edshot can do this in general, just the thousand sheet pierce extreme where he like spaghettifies himself that seems you know within his wheelhouse i guess but him becoming the heart of bakugo is obviously a little extreme since we never had any kind of idea or it was ever foreshadowed that he could do something like this so maybe he necessarily isn't exclusively able to perform this procedure because the way that he's talking to best genus here with so then i'll leave the rest to you maybe that doesn't necessarily just mean like you know being the leader on the battlefield here or whatever but maybe best genius is like going to manipulate Edshot here since he's becoming like all these strands. Maybe best genius is going to manipulate his muscle fibers and then like surgically repair Bakugo that way. Because, you know, why not at this point? We're just so far gone that just anything could happen now, right? It doesn't matter that Bakugo has been dead for two chapters and who knows how long that's been in real time. You know, the lack of oxygen to Bakugo's brain seemingly would cause brain damage, uh, maybe irreversible, but you know, let's just forget about that. This is battle manga, things are different. And that being said, does this like completely erase the stakes? Is this bad writing? And I'll say, I don't know. It's kind of somewhere in between. Do I think this is kind of sloppy and could it have been handled better? Yes, but there's also a part of me that likes the poppiness of this because it is very accessible. Like not everybody reading this is like a hardcore fan, of course. I think more so the majority of the casuals, once they see this in the anime, will probably really enjoy this sequence. And that's ultimately the only thing that matters. So again, I'm fine with it because there's a part of me that really enjoys pop and accessibility, but also bringing a balance so that people that are really into things, not necessarily like the hardcore psychos, but just, you know, the hardcores that aren't psychos can both enjoy, which is difficult to achieve, of course, but that's another reason why I just like battle manga in general, because I think it strikes that nice little balance. But sometimes I'm totally on board with things go a little too poppy because I don't know, I kind of like the recklessness of it. Now, also yesterday, I was tagged a lot with this comparison image here, which is Ed Shot being compared to the future version of Bakugo that Endeavor envisions in chapter 357. Now, I already went over this in my 357 review of course, but at the time, I didn't really know what to make of their appearances. I was more so focusing on Shoto and Izuku. But if you look here, Bakugo has like Edge Shot's 
tassels coming out of the back of his head. And I guess this answers the question that we had coming out of that panel. And it was like, is this a legitimate look into the future? Or is this kind of just like some kind of vision that Endeavor has that doesn't necessarily mean that it's literally going to happen? But I guess it is. Because another thing that I mentioned going over this panel is that it's too articulated. Like, why would Endeavor be envisioning things like seeing Shoto with a different haircut, Izuku with a new cape, you know, Bako with the tassels, Kaminari with like his new outfit. So I guess it means that this is like a legitimate glimpse of the future. And then Bako is going to survive here and of course realize that Headshot gave his life to become his heart so that he's going to, you know, wear the tassels in tribute. But also this means that Izuku is going to get the new stitched on cape, of course. And also that all of these characters are going to survive, meaning that the stakes are nearly non-existent at this point. And maybe Horikoshi didn't necessarily intend for us to go back and look at this and observe it as being the literal future, but I guess this means that it is. I certainly hope not. And not that I necessarily want any of these characters to die, but I would at least like to know that there's a chance they could. Especially Izuku. I thought there was a chance that he was going to give his life at the end of the story to save everyone, but now I guess that's just off the table. So when I say everybody hates this chapter, I don't know if everyone hates it. It's really hard to gauge what the consensus is on things like this, especially through social media. But I did see a lot of backlash and more so justified criticism because things are definitely getting clunky within the last uh, three chapters or so. And don't get me wrong, I've been very vocal about me wanting Bakugo to not die. I don't think it was necessary for him to die. And when he did, I certainly wanted him to come back to life by any means necessary. And when I said that, uh, I didn't know what we were getting into with the means uh, being what they are. And it's more so coming to light in this chapter because we're actually seeing it happening, like how Bakugo is coming back to life. We're getting more information on how this is all working, but also more information on Edshot's quirk fold a body because it says that he could flatten and stretch his body at will thanks to countless years of diligent training. His body can stretch thin and remain firm to prevent blood loss. So thin, it looks as if it were a spider web. So yeah, understandable. We saw Edshot do this at the end of the previous chapter and we don't really know everyone's ultimate ability. So I get that it's going to be outside of the norm for what we're accustomed to with what their base abilities are. I mean, that's kind of like the whole thing about the ultimates anyway, right? It's kind of like an extreme version of what they can do and it pushes the bounds of what we originally thought they were capable of. Hey, also guys, if you like my My Hero content, please subscribe if you haven't already. It's fine if you don't want to, but if you just need a reminder, here you go. Thanks. Then Edshot says, the bubble wash bestowed upon me, it shall cleanse Bakugo's body. So this is where it starts getting really clunky because what is being construed here is that apparently Wash, the pro hero in the top 10, who we haven't seen for a very long time, as far as I know, maybe we saw him at the beginning of this arc, I don't remember. But apparently off panel, he gave Edshot a bubble that he can just carry on him and he could just pull it out whenever he wants and and he's going to thread himself through this bubble and I guess sanitize himself. And this really makes me think more so Horikoshi is just writing this on the fly. Maybe not so much just the entire thing with Bakugo's death and him being saved by Edshot here, because like I said before, we do see Bakugo in Endeavor's vision of the future in chapter 357, and he has like the Edshot inspired braids. So, you know, he had it planned for at least that long, I guess. But the whole wash bubble thing here, I think he pretty much came up with this as he was maybe writing this chapter to fill in the whole plot hole of, you know, open heart surgery being performed here on a very filthy battlefield because otherwise he could have easily just set this up, right? Or just have wash here already. And another thing that I think we should take into consideration is that I'm pretty sure Horikoshi is like burnt out at this point. And I definitely can relate and understand because I myself have been burned out these last couple months. A lot of his chapters lately have been shorter than usual, which definitely is a big indication of fatigue and or burnout. We also saw this from him earlier this year, like he barely was able to complete that one chapter with Dobby and Shoto. And considering that he's been taking more breaks lately, this all makes me think he's been having a very hard time and maybe he can't necessarily write 
to the normal capacity that he would. But going further into this heart surgery here, Edshot says, I'll dive into his body despite Gina sewing it up. His heart is bleeding and the interior is badly damaged. So that means that what we were talking about in the previous chapters is true. Like best genus was like sewing up Bakugo's heart with his denim. And I don't think best genus had a wash bubble, did he? Because we didn't see it. So like his filthy battlefield worn out denim is like sewing up Bakugo's heart. Long story short, Edshot is using himself to completely heal Bakugo's heart using his ultimate ability where he spaghettifies himself. And he's not only going to mend the heart, but also his lungs, which were apparently damaged. And he's going to start pumping blood into his heart again, where he says he's going to perform CPR from the inside of his body. So this is how Bakugo is coming back to life. And I'm sure he'll be somewhat stronger because his heart is going to be reinforced with a friggin' hero. So so when Bakugo does come back, I wouldn't be surprised if he's like stronger than what he was originally. And he'll be able to mount a pretty good offense against Shigaraki slash all for one, hopefully. But speaking of uh, Shigaraki slash all for one, he's also a big part of this chapter as well, because we see that he's kind of upset that they're trying to do something with Bakugo because he says, I already destroyed that. And then he starts having like flashbacks of the My Villain Academia. And then he starts to like freak out. But Mirko comes in and is able able to fend him off because that's like her big purpose here and he says that last attack did stink just a bit am i accumulating damage no they didn't land that many blows that it must be impossible and then he remembers back to chapter 362 when bakugo was going after him in his cluster mode like moments before he died and at that time shigaraki slash all for one had said how is he making me so mad this random extra who doesn't even possess all for one why am i suddenly panicking and in reference to that he says my rage at that time do you mean to tell me that I felt a threat in him, me, in that nobody. So that's it. I guess he just felt threatened more so the Shigaraki aspect of the combination of beings here. And that seemed to trigger something in him and to make him more mentally unstable than he already is. Because at that moment in chapter 362, we also saw this glimpse of the second user of One For All. And that made us think so many things at that time. Like, why is he thinking of him? Especially because he's fighting Bago at this point. And I think I have possibly an explanation as to what's going on there. Because after Mirko lands a successful Luna Rush attack on Shigaraki here. He seems to get hurt by this again, and then he starts to remember like his family. And he says, even though I broke them, when I still wasn't broken, there was no one there, no one there to help me, even though everyone pretended not to see me. So I guess in all of this, him feeling threatened in that moment is reminding him of his family which you know, his dad obviously is a big part of the trauma in his childhood, aside from all of the other stuff that is implied that all for one set up. And considering that he was triggered by this feeling of being threatened, I guess this also triggered all for one's consciousness as well, since they are kind of linked at this point. And it reminded all for one of a time when he was threatened, possibly when he was facing off against the second user, like around a hundred years ago or something. So I guess he was able to amount a pretty considerable offense against all for one at that time, possibly. But since Shigaraki is like kind of mentally falling apart here, we start to see his family like form from his flesh mats stuff. And interestingly enough, we started to see his father's face form from him in chapter 362 when he was feeling threatened by Bakugo. So I guess this is like the ultimate downfall of all for one here. Not so much Shigaraki because he's just inherently a victim in all of this, of course. But all for one's big plan for Shigaraki was to raise him to be like this hatred vessel so that he can turn into what he currently is so that all for one could transfer his consciousness to this perfected body and he needed Shigaraki to have this like intense unrequited hatred because him and Yujiko somehow figured out that this was necessary in order for the all for one ability to take one for all because of like all the fail safes and stuff built into it but now it's kind of backfiring because Shigaraki has become too damaged and too unstable as to where we're seeing this freak out thing happening which I'm sure all 
all for one didn't intend to happen and i'm assuming that once all for one is done with what he's doing with endeavor and the rest of them like once rewind fully unwounds his body and reverse nothingness i guess his consciousness will have the full attention of what's going on here with the shigaraki vessel and then maybe he'll be able to take it over and control whatever malfunction is going on with his family mutating here but considering that it says a newly unleashed power threatens the heroes i guess he's going to be able to form like a meat puppet army out of this and they're all gonna gang up on the heroes or something but that's pretty much it for this video today guys let me know what you thought about this one did you hate it did you kind of like it were you ambivalent to it let me know and if you liked the video please give it a like and please subscribe if you haven't already have a great day and i'll see you in the next one